Yeah. Okay. So we're going to start with the new topic today. And because it's the time of year that a lot of book distribution goes on, we'll talk a little bit about book distribution and I'll give you, give you the history of book distribution as I know it. That'll be good for you. I don't think any of you have heard this before. Okay. Zeradha Madhava Kunjavi Hari Jayaradha Madhava Kunjavi Hari Kupir Janavalava Kirivaradhari Kupir Janavalava Giri-var-dhari Radha Madhava Kunjabihari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabihari Kupi Janavalava Giri-var-dhari Gopi Janavalava Giri Bharadhari Jashoda Nandana Braja Janaranjana Jashoda Nandana Braja Janaranjana Jamuna Tira Banachari Jamuna Tira Banachari Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jaya Radha Mar <coughs> Hava Kunjabi Hari Gopi Janavalava Giri Bharadhari Gopi Janavalava Giri Bharadhari Jishodhanandana Braja Janaranjana Jishodhanandana Braja Janaranjana Jamuna Tira Banachari Jamuna Tira Banachari Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jai Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Gopi Janabalava Giri Bharadhari Gopi Janabalava Giri Bharadhari Jishodhanandana Braja Janaranjana Jishodhanandana Braja Janaranjana Jamuna Tira Vanachari Jamuna Tira Vanachari Jamuna Tira Vanachari Jamuna Tira Banachari Jai Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Shlubhu Padaki Jem Itai Go Permanandi Hari Hari Bo Nama Um Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Shamini Tinamani Namaste, Sarishati Deve, Gaudavani Picharine, and every say, Sasanyabadi Pischati this time. So, every year at this time, there's a big push to distribute Prabhupada's books. And one might think, why not push all year? Why just now? So, I want to explain why this came to pass in ISKCON that during this month, more devotees would go out on book distribution and they would go out for longer hours. So in order to explain this, I want to explain a little history about book distribution that, that led up to the first Christmas marathon. As you know, when Prabhupada came, he brought his Bhagavatams. So he was the original book distributor. He was distributing back to God in magazines. Uh, when he was a Grihasta. He was um, selling his Bhagavatams when they were, once they were published in New York in bookstores. 
<clears throat> devotees would go like 10 years ago, they would go to a bookstore in New York and they say, oh yeah, your spiritual master came here in 1965. We got, we bought his books. So Prabhupada was the original, of course, author, but book distributor because he was the only one who could sell his books. He sold his books to the captain on the boat he gave him about $20, which was probably used up in taxi fees. His rupees were, we say he came with a certain amount of rupees, but he couldn't spend rupees. He couldn't cash rupees in. So it really came with nothing. But he did sell those books. So he was doing book distribution. And he was pushing us initially to publish Back to Godhead. And that was the original book distribution was Back to Godhead. It's nothing. Any other book distribution that went on was done at the temple. But as far as anything else, it was not brought out generally on Sankirtan. It might have been a book here or there. But generally, <clears throat> we would approach people with Back to God. That was the main magazine of the movement. It was meant to be a way to introduce people. So what was interesting is that when we talk about book distribution, especially in those days, up till maybe 1971, book distribution meant magazine distribution. It wasn't actually books. Oh, we had Bhagavad Gita, had teachings of Lord Chaitanya, Krishna book had come out, and Nectar Devotion had come out. But up till we discovered big book distribution, it was back to Godhead magazine and maybe Easy Journey to Other Planets or some small book. And I remember specifically that we didn't even think we could sell us a book like Easy Journey because it was more expensive than a Back to Godhead. Back to Godhead was 50 cents. We would sell it for 25 cents. And I think the Easy Journey was like a dollar. We thought that was a tremendous amount of money and people on the street wouldn't be that interested. So Prabhupada was talking about book distribution. And for us, book distribution was just magazines. And so nobody really, nobody really, really picked up on, on that. And it, it's interesting because you would think as disciples of Prabhupada, we would, you know, do whatever he says. But there were many things to do and many programs. And devotees didn't always pick up entirely on what Prabhupada wanted. Like, like, or maybe by doing magazines, we thought well, we were doing what he wanted. And we didn't really examine it more. Nobody thought, well, maybe, maybe instead of giving people BTG, we should give them Bhagavad Gita or Krishna book or, or even a smaller book, a bigger book, a, a small, a bigger than Back to God. We didn't, we just had Back to God. And the way things work in organizations is they, they tend to stay the same and people don't question. And every once in a while, some devotee will come along and question, why are we only doing back to Godheads? Why don't we do something else? And I was that devotee who questioned it. I'm taking credit here because I'm so proud. But according to the history that I understand, um, I could be wrong, but as far as I know, I was the one who questioned, as I often question many things in ISKCON, as you know. I always tend to question the status quo. So I questioned. Uh, it wasn't even really a question. It was kind of like, why don't we take some big books out with us? They're just sitting in the temple. We only sell them on Sunday. And everybody thought, yeah, we'll take them out. We'll show them to people. And the idea was that the only people that would buy a big book are really people who are interested, like who come to the temple, but people on the street wouldn't buy them because they're not interested. That's what we thought. But we thought, well, let's take the books out just for fun. You know, who knows? You know, maybe someone will actually take it. And so we didn't actually think anyone would take it. We didn't have a concept of big book distribution. We didn't think people would be interested in it in bigger books unless they were devotees. And we actually sold two books that day. Two different devotees sold one book, which was 
which for us was like this major breakthrough. We realized that people who weren't coming to the temple, some people would be interested in, and we didn't know that, we didn't think that. So that was a huge breakthrough and we were excited. And right around that time, a devotee came to our temple, was very enthusiastic. He was hyper enthusiastic. If you, the, he, the more difficult something was, the more enthusiastic he, he became about it. If it was impossible, he said, count me in, I'm, I'm, I'm ready. That's what excited him. If it was easy, he didn't get excited. So we told him about books and he was a book distributor, big books. And he got so excited that he started distributing big books every day. Like we just thought we were lucky and he started doing it every day and we couldn't believe it. And then we went on the road and did traveling Sankirtan and he was distributing big books like crazy. And this had never been done before in ISKCON. And so we would distribute like one or two books a week and he would distribute like one or two or three or four every day. So we had set the world's record for ISKCON at that point with 60 Krishna books in a month. That was the record because people would sell like one at the Sunday feast. But what this devotee did, he had just come from the San Francisco temple, which was a, really a center of book distribution and enthusiasm. And he told the president, you know, we're selling Krishna books. And the president was saying, well, we're selling like case loads of BTGs. And this devotee said, you're in Maya, get out Krishna books. So this devotee was very heavy, has very heavy and he's from Canada, but kind of reminded me of a New York Jewish person. You're in Maya, get out there with Krishna books. Like that kind of, you know, mood, you know, just, well, you think you're so great. You know? So anyway, it, it, it caught on fire in San Francisco and then San Francisco, called LA and LA caught on fire. And then a devotee from, from up nor Northern California came to Los Angeles and his name was Triparari and he really broke open book distribution in a new way, both with small books and big books. He had a different style of doing book distribution where um, you would just say a few things to somebody, uh, you know, in 30 seconds or a minute, they would take a book and give a donation. And then he and his team learned how to distribute big books. And so, um, but it happened gradually, but it, it, with any innovation, it only takes one person to think, why don't we try this? Like, you know, why don't we create an electric car? Why don't we, whatever has been created, right? Maybe, um, the devotee told me there's a new kind of tire they're making. It doesn't have air in it, so you can't get a flat tire. Like, why don't we make a tire that you can't get flat? Okay, yeah. No, no, you know, we've always had tires with air. No? So it takes one person to think, why don't you make a postage stamp? You don't have to lick. It took about, three, you know, 100 years to figure that out, right? But someone has to, someone, you know, someone has to think of it. And it's, it's common sense, basically. So that's how it happened. Um, I'm going to take credit for it because I don't think it was being done anywhere else anyway. There is some who say it was being done anywhere else, but I was there on the phone call. They said they were doing it in San Francisco, but I was on the phone call when they told us we're doing cases of BTGs every day. They didn't say Krishna books. And that devotee said, you're Maya because you're not doing Krishna books. So that's why I say I have proof. It wasn't really me. It was this devotee, Taco Hardis. He's the really, I just had the idea. He was the one who did it. But so from that point, BTG, distribution continued, but we would usually like give someone a BTG and if we see they're interested, we would give them a Krishna book or Bhagavad Gita. Then eventually it evolved, evolved to you give them a Bhagavad Gita and if, and if they were, weren't interested, you'd give them a, you'd give them a BTG. So it switched I'm like, oh, I don't have any money. Okay, take a BTG. But Previously, it was like, here's a BTG of, oh, I'm really interested. Oh, have you seen Bhagavad Gita? Then we'd show them other books. So it evolved. And then eventually, as book distribution is today, around 1973, 74, it was devotees going out with big books, especially to airports and just approaching people with the books because they learned how to sell them. They learned how to get donations uh, big enough to pay for the books. 
And the world has evolved a lot since that time. And there, there was interest in Prabhupada's books, but it wasn't massive because most people were not vegetarians. People thought reincarnation was weird. Karma was not a common word. Mantra was not a, word, a common word. There was meditation, but it was not. It was kind of on the side, the periphery of society. Now, all these things are, are fairly mainstream. So when you go out with books now and you say, well, these books are on yoga meditation, everybody's heard of that. It's totally different. People now, you set up a book table with books and you say, these are books on yoga meditation. People come up and they start looking at the books. Whereas before we had to force them. So it's, it's become much easier. And devotees now are distributing more books than we ever distributed during Prabhupada's time, because there's more interest, so it's evolved. So, in the United States, laws have changed there, but previously, the law was that if there was private, any private property that was open to the public was considered public. In America, you have a freedom of religion, which means you can practice your religion in any public place, which means you can sell books in any public area. So there are a lot of stores. Like in America, we have a big store called Walmart. I think you have Walmart in different countries or similar stores where it's a big parking lot and a big store that has everything, you basically everything you need. And um, so there were a lot of these stores under different names in Los Angeles, and Los Angeles, Los Angeles basically goes for like 50 miles in like every direction. You know, it's a, well, if it goes 50 miles west, you'll be in the ocean, but it goes, you can drive 50, 60 miles, and the, the cities have different names. It's basically just an extension of Los Angeles. And if you go south, you, you just one city after another, it kind of never ends. Um, a little bit like that going north, not as much. So it's like there were so many of these stores. And they couldn't ask us ask us to leave because first it was the, the freedom of religion and it was considered public property. Even the shopping malls up till 1972, we would go into shopping malls and we would have Hari Nam. We'd go, in those days, shopping malls were not indoors. They were shopping malls, but they're outdoors. They're just like a regular shopping mall, but no ceiling. They looked the same, but there was no ceiling. And so the shopping malls, we're becoming the new downtowns. The, like in Europe, your downtowns are still, you know, your downtowns are nice. But in America, the downtowns are more like business districts with huge skyscrapers. And in Europe, you have nicer downtowns with paved off with cobblestone, paved off areas where no, it's just for walking and shopping. So that's what the malls were like. So people stopped going downtown, start going to the malls. So we would do Harinam in the malls and, and we would uh, distribute books and magazines with the Harinam party. That was the origin, original book distribution was never done without a Harinam party. Did you know that? There was no such thing as like going out with books. It was, you would all go out with the Harinam party and say, okay, Luke, okay, Gabriella, you distribute BTGs. And so you'd have, you'd be on either side of the Harinam party. And then after like an hour, they go, okay, go be not, and Jason, you do it. Then, you know, you go back into the Harinam party, then you too. That's how it was done. Nobody ever went off on their own without a Harinam party. And nobody traveled outside their city. So, um, so they, we had these little stores in 1972. Um, this took place in 1972, so, and I was in Los Angeles when this happened. So we had these stores, and those were the best places for book distribution, and you probably, in the Los Angeles area, you had like hundreds of these stores. Every six, seven miles, there'd be some store. Walmart, they didn't have Walmart, then they had other stores. Kmart, Zodi's, some of these stores don't exist, Sears, this and that. So we would just get dropped off. You know, we drive out after breakfast, get dropped off. And then you just be there all day by yourself, distributing magazines. And then you get picked up like in the evening. And then on the weekends, you'd stay out later, maybe till like eight or nine o'clock. So 
during Christmas time, the stores stay open late. They stay open until midnight. And during Christmas time, people are in a giving spirit. So your donations, your number of books distributing donations increases exponentially. It's like, usually it's like, you know, you approach 10 people, you get one yes. Around Christmas time, it's like you get, for every 10 people, you get like seven yeses. It's like, you know, here, you get a book, you know, it's Christmas, can you give a donation? Oh, sure. You know, the Christmas donation is just like, okay, they just give. So we were distributing more magazines and books than ever. And so normally we, we would be picked up at nine o'clock. And so all the devotees simultaneously who were out, this was like, I don't know, 20 devotees, 25, whatever. Um, I can't remember how many were out. Yeah, it could have been more. When I was Sankirtan leader in Los Angeles, we had 25 men and I wasn't in charge of the women, but there were like 20 plus women. So we had like 45 devotees. And then during Christmas, we would have like 200, like everybody would go out. If you didn't go out, we would look at you with evil eyes. Like, why aren't you going out? What's wrong with you? Are you and Maya? Um, so simultaneously, every single devotee stayed out till midnight because, you know, it's like a few days before Christmas and everybody's generous and and they're distributing like more magazines in an hour than, than the rest of the year they would distribute all day. So they like, they couldn't leave. They go, this is crazy. Why should I leave? But normally they'd leave like eight, maybe nine at the latest on a, on a weekend. And so one devotee who was kind of in charge of everything, Rameshwar, he was out and he, he thought, well, we all normally get back about 9.30 or 10 and they're probably all waiting for me and I don't want them to wait up. So I'll, he pulled himself away at like 11 o'clock and he drove back and he drove into the Sankirtan office and the Sankirtan leader was there, but nobody was there. And he said, what, they all came back and went to sleep? And the Sankirtan leader said, no, no one's come back yet. <laughs> so he, and then they all came back like 1230 at night and he, and he realized that they all did the same thing. They couldn't, stay away because it was so good. So this was probably like, I don't know, maybe December 22nd or something like that. So then they all, you know, got together, had their huddle and they all, you know, realized this is like amazing time for book distribution. And so they just planned to stay out till midnight for the rest of the Christmas. And, th and that was the first Christmas marathon. And that, and they distributed, they never did that before. So they distributed more books than they'd ever distributed. And Prabhupada was in LA. So they just had to write a little note, send it to the servant, Prabhupada would read it and he, he would write back. You'd get like this immediate response. So by, by the next, by that evening or the next morning, you get a response from Prabhupada. And one letter, when, when they gave the totals to Prabhupada said that never in the history of the world have so many religious books ever been sold. Because because like I'm saying, they're selling every hour what they would sell in a day or maybe more. And so these huge scores are coming in. And <laughs> Prabhupada was so inspired. So you can imagine. If your spiritual master gives you an order and then you have people helping you fulfill that order, doing it for you, imagine how inspiring that is, right? So, you know, sometimes I will thank my disciples, say, thank you for doing this. And some disciples say, no, don't thank me, thank you. But, but Prabhupada was always thanking his disciples. And, you know, because he was one man distributing books on his own. And um, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur had asked him to distribute books. So you can imagine how Prabhupada felt that now his disciples are helping him execute the order of a spiritual master. This is what he was told to do. And now it's happening. Hundreds of thousands, millions of books are being distributed. And who are they being distributed by? His disciples. So you can imagine how grateful Prabhupada was. Um, and there was one lecture on Srila Bhakti Siddhanta's disappearance day. It was in de December. And he said, um, Prabhupada said, he was talking about 
the mercy of his guru. And he said, and then he said, but I have to thank you. I have to thank you more because you are helping me execute the order of my spiritual master. And then he just broke down and started crying. So that shows how dear the order of the spiritual master, of his spiritual master was to Prabhupada, how dear that order of book distribution was to Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, therefore it became dear to Prabhupada. And how dear and how appreciative Prabhupada was for the devotees because they were helping him do that. And so, you know, it's like, I have to thank you more because you're helping me. In other words, uh, Prabhupada would often say, what could one man do alone? I, he said, I came to your country, I was loitering in, loitering in the street. It means I was just, I had, had nobody to help. I was just alone trying to do something. And it's a fact, although, uh, although we know, we understand everything happens by Prabhupada's mercy. It's only by his mercy that we could do anything. But the fact is, if nobody took up Krishna consciousness, there couldn't have been a movement. There would have been Prabhupada's books, but there would have been no Sangha because no one would become devotees. Some people would come here as lectures and then they'd just go home and smoke pot and do whatever they do. Well, that's what they did then. And, you know, just continue their, their life, their materialistic life as normal. But because they adopted it, now Prabhupada had so, foot soldiers and those foot soldiers were sharing Krishna consciousness, and then as we're discussing here, distributing his books. So imagine nobody took it up and Prabhupada's alone. What could he have done alone? He could have written books. If he could have gotten money to live in America, even how would he get the money if he didn't have followers? So this is just, this is like, you could say a scientific fact. If you study how movements develop, they have what's called first adopters. If you don't have first adopters, the movement can't grow because it's just somebody talking with an idea, but nobody's adopting it. And the adopters are the ones who spread it. I mean, you know, occasionally you'll have something, someone writes a book and it strikes a chord in people, um, but not all books create movements, right? It still takes somebody to run with it. Like, um, Bhakti Siddhanta had a disciple and he organized Bhakti Siddhanta. He did uh, Bhakti Siddhanta on his own, um, apparently wouldn't have been able to have established such a movement, but this other disciple took it, made it happen. So that's why Prabhupada was so appreciative of the devotees who were distributing his books. And so um, he was so inspired by that. And that's why the devotees were inspired because they knew Prabhupada was inspired and they they just wanted to, you know, we say sometimes, oh, we're too concerned with the book scores, right? It's all about the numbers. And and of course we understand it, it's, it's more than numbers. It's our effort, our sincerity, and distributing with compassion, doing it in the proper way, giving people, inspiring people to read the books and so forth. But the reason there was so much emphasis on the numbers is because we saw how inspired Prabhupada was by those numbers. <laughs> so, you know, he said, his book scores are my life and soul. So naturally, the devotees wanted to increase the numbers. And in their enthusiasm to create the, increase the numbers, sometimes they did some things which today we can look back and say, those were the wrong ways to distribute books. We don't do that anymore, as far as I know. But being a little too pushy, maybe not straightforward with people. And it had, it had its repercussions. So, but that's why devotees were enthusiastic with the numbers. Um, they were also enthusiastic because they know the more books that were distributed, the more chances there were for people to become Christian conscious. So now this book distribu distribution marathon is also coming up and it's a different ISKCON now. In those days, it was 90% lived in the temple. Now it's the opposite, 90% don't. So you had an army of brahmacharis and brahmacharinis living in the temple. And, but at those times, even the grihastas um, who were full-time temple devotees living outside the temple, but full-time engaged in temple work, 
they would all shut down everything they're doing. And they all, everybody would go out and book distribution. The whole place would shut down. Of course, that doesn't happen anymore. But even departments that couldn't shut down would go out on the weekends. So it was this massive, it just, that's what traditionally the Christmas marathon became a time when as many people would remove themselves from their other services, go out on book distribution, or at least go out on the weekends. So um, not, every, not all of you can go out. Uh, subsequently, I think in the late 90s, in Europe, they decided to make their Christmas marathon not at Christmas time because it was too cold. So they changed it to a summer marathon because it was just really hard for devotees to stay out as many hours as we could stay out in America where it wasn't as cold. So that subsequently changed. But um, last year, with COVID, uh, devotees were uh, calling up people, getting mailing lists, calling up people they met, and selling books on the phone and shipping the books out. So uh, in some countries, what they do is they will find sponsors. And like you say, could you donate for like a set of books or some books? And then devotees would distribute those books or put them in libraries or go to school libraries, public libraries like that. Um, um, what we do in America is we put them in hotels, hotels that are owned by Indians. Say, so here's a Bhagavad Gita. Would you take it and put it in the, the room along with the Bible? And most uh, good Hindus, even some bad ones, would also would take the book. And so you'll find lots of Bhagavad Gita's now in hotels. Most of the hotels in America, or smaller hotels at least, are owned by Indians. We call them Hotel Patel. That's just the, somehow or other. Um, Gujaratis and hotels have become married in America. So um, there was a program to raise money and you would donate money. Maybe you can't go out yourself, but you could give some money and then they would put the books at their libraries, hotels like that. So um, other things we can do, we can enthuse devotees to distribute books. We can take books with us wherever we go. There's always, yeah, there's always opportunities. You know, I mean, there's this, you know, this debate, should you dress in Western dress or you should you dress in a dhoti korta sari? Well, don't wear a dhoti and a sari at the same time. Um, sh should you dress in a dhoti korta sari choli? Yeah, not all at the same time. Um, so, um, but some devotees like to do it because people will sometimes come up, especially in Mexico, like, like, are you a priest? What are you? Why are you dressed that way? To have some respect. If you have a book, it's go, here's a book. It's easy. You don't even have to try. And um, what devotees have found in the last maybe 15 years, which, which is quite new in a sense for us, is that putting books on the table on a college campus, students just come, you just say, these are books on yoga and meditation. They come over and they practically just buy them themselves. You don't even have to be that good of a book distributor. And still they will buy because they're interested. So um, those book tables were developed long ago because not everyone wants to approach people, you know, like, excuse me, sir. So some, some devotees feel like I, I can't do that. It's just like, I'm intruding on people or they're going to spit in my face or say something nasty, which could happen depending on the neighborhood you're in or the country you're in. But um, that, that of course, normally doesn't happen, but it does happen sometimes. Uh, so the table is easier because you're not approaching them, they're approaching you. It's a different psychology. So, so um, and then they had this thing called smart, smart boxes where you would find a store who would take books and say, could you just put these books, display these books? And they had a little donation box with a suggested donation. So you don't even do anything. You just leave it in the store and people will see it, like maybe Yoga Studio or any store. Um, and there was a little rack and a little donation box. And then you'd come back periodically and pick up the money and put more books in. So that's easy. If you don't like people, that's the way to distribute. And you don't have to talk to anybody. You only have to talk to one person, the store manager. That's it. Um, and 
some devotees also will, they'll get some money and they'll give the money um, and buy some books or they'll give the money to a book distributor and he'll buy the books. And so that if a book distributor is, let's say, distributing Bhagavad Gita's and he needs to get $5 for each Gita and you give him 100 Gita's, now he only needs to get $2 for each Gita or $1. He could give any or he could give 100 Gita's out to interested people. So you could give the books, buy the books, give them, or give him the money and say, here, now you can give out so many books because they're already paid for. So there are various ways. And um, so this time of year, we try to focus on that a little bit. Maybe slow down a few other services and focus on this just to get more books out to people. And for you also to experience the, the transcendental bliss of distributing Prabhupada's books because when you distribute his books, he is pleased. And so that's the basic idea. And so if we if we go back, if we go back to Prabhupada's original mission in coming to America and original instruction from his spiritual master, it was to preach in English and preaching, uh, Prabhupada always said preaching through books is substantial. That's it's Prabhupada always felt like people won't take you seriously until you have books. Books are authority. And so, you know, Prabhupada saw there were so many gurus. Um, I recently saw an interview with Sadhguru. Some of you have heard of Sadhguru. And Sadhguru said he's never read Bhagavad Gita. I thought that was interesting. Um, and I assume he doesn't have a guru. He's self-made. And so, Prabhupada felt that the, the power of Krishna consciousness, not he felt, he told us, it is a fact, the power of Krishna consciousness is authority. The authority of, you know, this is not, you know, because people say it's a cult. And so Prabhupada understood that, that people would, would look at Krishna consciousness and think this is just some new made up religion. Some, somebody made, some charismatic leader made this religion, he came, convinced all these naive, frustrated hippies. And now they're out there, you know, doing something that has no, it has no authority. It's just his idea. Um, so, um, got a message from the gods, hold on. Must be important. Don't go anywhere. Hmm. Okay, not that important. Hmm. It was from the person I thought who would text me. Okay. So, yeah, so you'll, you'll read some some places where, I mean, you can see Prabhupada, when was Prabhupada ready to come to America? He didn't want to come without books, right? It was when his books were published and he was ready. I mean, he had Bhagavad Gita, but he wanted Bhagavatam. So he didn't want to come until Bhagavatam. Interesting, right? And so there are different places where Prabhupada said, you know, wherever we preach, we have to have books because that shows this is authorized. It's an authorized movement, it's authority. And then um, you might know the story. Prabhupada, as I said, he was talking about book distribution, but that translated for us as magazine distribution, or maybe there was just an assumption that that's all you could distribute was magazines. And then Prabhupada told the story that said he met a man, I don't know if he was a friend or an acquaintance, and the man said to him, well, you're publishing Back to Godhead, but he said, magazines, people, they'll throw away, right? Books, you don't, you don't throw away books. Magazines, sometimes, yeah, taking up space. Okay, I read the magazine, throw it away. Newspapers, definitely throw, thrown away. Not that there's not a place for them. But his friend said, you should publish books because books last, right? Books are, you know, they're, you know, books have a, 
And then I, the first book I published, um, the reason I published it specifically was because I was, um, I was at that point starting to speak in the corporate circles and other circles. And I thought, well, if you don't have a PhD, the best next best thing is a book, right? If you have both, you're, you know, they take you more seriously. But at least if you have a book, you're somebody, you're an author, right? That's like a big thing, you know, isn't it? PhD sounds better than author, but author is pretty good. If you have, you know, lots of books, it's really good. So I thought being a bona fide university dropout is not really a qualification that's going to impress anybody. Although I think Bill Gates, Zuckerberg, Steve Jobs were all university dropouts. So I, you know, it's not a bad idea always, but um, you can't really put that on your business card. UDO, university dropout. What's a UDO? Oh, I dropped at university. I was the smartest kid in my class. I figured should drop out, you know. But the stupid ones stayed, you know. Now they're working nine to five jobs, which are now eight to seven jobs. Uh, but not everyone will understand that. So, um, so I wrote a book. I just, it was just quotes, uplift yourself. So it was easy to write. We just had to find some quotes, categorize them. And I had a book, ta-da, and edited it a little bit. And people are like, oh, you have a book. Yeah, you're on Amazon. You're an author. So um, there's credibility there in having, having a book. So, so this friend or acquaintance, whatever, told Prabhupada, you know, books last. They stay on the shelves. And so Prabhupada started, he took that seriously, publishing the Bhagavatam. And then we had this question, two questions. This was basically one question, you know, like we're distributing, we were distributing Bhagavad Gita's and Krishna books. Then the Srimad Bhagavatam started being published, second canto, third canto, fourth canto. And the only way they could really afford to publish them is to print in large quantities. And the only way they can print in large quantities is if we had distributed them. So each canto would come out, right? Oh, second canto, first volume. We'd go out and distribute that. Oh, second canto, second volume. We'd go out and distribute that, you know. Oh, and then we were up to like six canto, Yamaduta is on the cover. Okay, we got it. We can distribute this one now. That's what we were doing, you know. So here, take the book. See these guys? You don't know Chan Hare Krishna, you're going to meet them, you know. Give a donation, yeah. Punch you in the nose for that. Actually, one guy, um, the story is one man, when he saw those, he had a near-death experience, and, and he looked at the book, and he said, I saw them. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, these amazing experiences you have on Santa Krishna. Um, so as the books were being published, we had to distribute them to pay for them. You know, so we as devotees, we all got our sets, but you just couldn't print a, you know, a thousand of each book. It would be extremely expensive. So to keep the printing costs down, we, you know, and we distributed, I don't know, print 50,000 or something of each volume. And then uh, devotees would say, Prabhupada, two things were happening. So like, you know, can they understand these books? It's like just the middle of the Bhagavatam. There was some, you know, you, you give someone a book and you think, well, they understand anything. And then what was happening was a lot of people just look at the book, Sanskrit, this and that, weird, you know, look at the pictures and like this. They weren't ready for it. So sometimes they would just leave it in the airport or they would throw it in the trash can. Just like, you know, because to them, they just had given a donation and got a book. So it wasn't like they bought the book. So they didn't necessarily think, well, I spend so much money on this, let me read it. That's there also. Sometimes they think that way, but sometimes they don't. And then there were even workers at some airports who, who were telling people that were a cult and you shouldn't read the book, just give it to me. And then they would rip the books up and they would throw them in the trash and like that. Um, and the smarter ones would just come back with the books and say, give me a dollar for each book. And so we'd buy the books back for a dollar. So, but most of those guys were just finding them in the trash cans and selling it back. 
And so, you know, every few days you'd get like 10, 15 books they found. But there were, in some airports, people, uh, workers telling people don't buy the books. You, you don't want that book, I'll take it from you. So that's why this question came up. Can they understand the book? They're leaving the book. Then Prabhupada said a few things. One thing he said is, well, you know, what to speak of leaving the book, they're leaving their babies, they're aborting their babies from the womb, you know, it's just nothing compared to that, right? So it was kind of like, what can you expect from people? So Prabhupada's mood was so merciful is that you, you don't know who's going to appreciate the book, so you can't stop distributing because of the people who don't appreciate it and the people who misuse it or the people who wouldn't understand it. That was his mood. But when they asked the question about reading, you know, that a lot of people, they look at the book and they won't read it. And at one time Prabhupada said, well, even if they don't read it, they've touched it. And it's a deity, it's Krishna. Bhagavatam is Krishna. So they become purified by touching. Of course, it's better they read it. It's better we, you know, mentor them, obviously. So I'm not, I'm not saying, well, that's, you know, just go out and sankirtan. If everybody touches the book, you just learn, here, take this book, check it out. Give it back to me. Thank you. Go to the next, touch it. Okay, that could be a service. You know, better than sitting home, right? And, and surfing the internet. So that could be a service, but service. The Prabhupada was trying to encourage that that any contact with the book is beneficial. That was the idea. Not that the ultimate contact is to just touch it. Oh, how many books did you distribute today? Zero, but 108 people touched them. Oh, yeah. How many books did you distribute? 108. Um, and they all threw them away. No, it's so. Obviously, that's not a justification for not distributing books properly and giving people books that they can understand and appreciate and getting their names and staying in touch with them and encouraging them and so forth. That's, that's much better, obviously. But these questions came up. And, and then Prabhupada said you know, to, the, to the question, but what if they don't understand? He said, well, if they read one shloka, their life will become perfect. And, you know, and you can say, well, they read one shloka, they become devotee. Maybe not in this life, maybe the next life. But if they read one, one verse, that was, spiritually speaking, probably the best thing they've done in this lifetime, isn't it? That was Prabhupada's point. Okay, you know, here, look at this verse. You know, sometimes devotees would read a verse, they'd open the book, look at it, they'd find a verse that they felt people could appreciate, and they'd read the verse with people. You know, what do you think of that? You know, say this this Bhagavatam is like the sun. See the sun there? And they go, yeah, it's lighting up everything, right? This book will light up your life, you know. And so they read a verse with people, and and they would feel, you know, very, very satisfied, very blissful that you know, I was able to read a verse. And then and then Prabhupada said, why to speak of a verse, even one word, even if they read one word, because every word in Bhagavatam is transcendental. I mean, you know, we don't. We don't see it like this, right? To our logical brain, it's like, I'm giving them a book and they've only read one book, one word out of 400 pages. And that was beneficial. Yeah, well, it was the best word they ever read, right? They're holding Bhagavatam. <laughs> At least they read one word. So Prabhupada was trying to encourage us. But as, as book distributors, it was kind of like being in Las Vegas because you didn't know what was going to happen when a person got a book. And so you you didn't you didn't want to second guess anybody because a lot of a lot of people who've become devotees now say they say we ask, Well, how did you become a devotee? And they say, Well, I read Bhagavad Gita. Well, how did you get Bhagavad Gita? And said, well, my mother got it in 1975 in an airport and she didn't read it, but she thought she saw that I was interested in Eastern philosophy. So she gave me the book, you know, like 40 years later or whatever, we're up to 30, 36 years later, 
is it 36? 46, 46 years later, the book's been sitting on the shelf for 46 years, no one's touching it. Of course, it's illuminating the whole house because it's a deity and it's in the house, so it's auspicious. And now the daughter reads it. So there was, there was a sense that Prabhupada gave us that there would come a, become a time or gradually the time would come when society would shift enough that people would be much more interested in the books than they were at that time. At that time, you'd go out all day, you, you really wouldn't meet interested people. You could go the whole day and not meet anyone that you felt like, this is somebody that I would want to bring to, I'd even want to go to the temple. But at the same time, you didn't know because your exchanges were very short. And they're running through the airport late for a plane. And so, you know, you didn't know. But the cool thing about distributing books in those days is all the touring bands were going through the airport. So I think all the famous rock bands, they all got books. I, I remember distributing a book to the drummer of some huge rock band. He was burned out from traveling. Like, that must be hard to travel. He goes, yeah. <laughs> but you know, you'd meet um, famous actors because everybody has to travel, you know? So the more, the more receptive ones, you know, they would sit and talk. And so we got books out to lots of people, you know? So, and so I think that was Prabhupada's mood is just like, get as many out because sitting in the warehouse doesn't do anybody any benefit. And even though they're going to take the book and throw them away, just like they throw away their babies, their embryos, um, we still have to give them out because it, it'll be beneficial. Um, and whatever they'll suffer for that sin of throwing away Bhagavatam, they'll also benefit eternally from touching it. So um, then in subsequent years, you know, we were, you, you could say we were a little narrow-minded with that philosophy because it was just like, just get the book in their hand somehow or other, and you've done your job. Uh, and many devotees, and more so now, we're feeling, well, that's just the first part of the job. There has to be more contact, place for people to call in, learn, and so forth. And we need books which are easy to understand. And so um, the book Coming Back, Higher Taste, and Chan and Be Happy were actually created for college students, inexpensive books, easy to understand. And so it took Prabhupada's ideas and written by Druta Karma, Mukunda Maharaj, easily understandable. And um, good for college students who don't have a lot of time to read, and it's easy to read. So there were efforts to bridge some gaps, um, reading groups, you know, distribute books and then have a reading group, invite people, we'll all read together, explain. I became a devotee because I attended Bhagavad Gita class twice a week. So it was explained to me. So I, I got it very clearly. So these things, of course, are there, not always possible, but follow-up, communication, all of this. Um, this is more, um, this is happening more now than then. So I don't want uh, you to think, oh, what's this? You just distribute a book and, you know, we distribute millions of books and like three people out of a million read them. and what, yeah. um, Many of us felt that way, of course. But... Um, But still, you know, we want to do our we want to do our best to follow up. But still, Prabhupada, he stressed distributing books, and uh, so that's what we did. And it evolved in different ways, different styles, different places. And I think what we see today, there is no one way to do it, and you do it according to what suits you best what you feel comfortable with. And some people, they're just uncomfortable approaching people, but they can support it in other ways. I was, I was normally thank your tongue leader. Um, not always, but for many years, that was my seva. So that's my Christmas marathon was just organizing it from early in the morning to late at night. That was my service. Um, we had cooks. They were the they were the, you know, feeding the soldiers who were going out. The most important Sankirtan devotees were in the kitchen, actually. Because without good prasadam, nobody could do it. 
Um, and then we had a whole group of devotees helping with organization, loading the vans, figuring out where devotees will go. Um, we had people opening up through legal channels, opening up spots. So we, you know, places which were public places that told us we couldn't go, we'd have to have cases. Uh, some of us would go out to get arrested so we could have a case. That's actually how we did it. And I, I think I was in jail five times. Before I was voting. No, not before I was voting on Sankirtan. But that was also part of it, that sometimes we would go out and say, go out and get arrested. You know, then they'd get us out, but then we'd have a case and we could fight it to get the right to distribute at that place. So we were... We're very focused, and that's just, this is what Prabhupada wanted. And then, in the several years after Prabhupada left, book distribution increased more than ever. Seventy-eight was the biggest year. Seventy-nine, bigger. Eighty, I think, went up to eighty-two. Was getting bigger every, every year. And then, due to um, the inevitable difficulties that ensued when a great acharya leaves, it um, started decreasing and. People lose sometimes losing faith in the process or feeling that we, we created so many problems with our book distribution, which is true. We did because we uh, didn't treat people as well as we should have. And so there was a decline. And then by Shesheka Prabhu, Vijaya Prabhu, they really started churning the fire that we used to have. And now it's on an upswing. Or maybe it surpassed what we did even in Prabhupada's time. So now it's it's coming back. But the um, society is different because you don't have a large number of full-time devotees who can go out. So so now we just encourage devotees to do what they can for Christmas. You know, if all you can do is give some donation, then do that. You know, most temples will have devotees who will distribute the books, or you can give it to the hotel pro program, hotel, I forget what they call it. Motel, no, I think they call it Motel Gita. That's Jason. Do you know what they call it? Have you heard of that? Motel Gita, is, do you know about that? Does that sound right? Motel Gita, I think that's what it is. And it, yeah, that, yeah. And if you don't have that in your country, you could also start that if there are a lot of Indian hotels or maybe even pious people, pious pious people in your country might put it in their hotel. You know, just you think of ways um, of getting it. Um, different institutions that may be interested in their, you know, um, sometimes offices, you know, waiting rooms. Could I, could I leave this book here? I'm like, sure, you know. You leave some, you know, science of self-realization, people read it, you know. In there you can say, if you like this book, just take it. And then, you know, occasionally you call them up and say, is that, is that book still there? And they go, no, oh, I'll give you another one. I'll give you two. You know, chiropractic offices, naturopathic doctors, like that. Why not, right? So, Prabhupada had this phrase, which he used over and over again. He said, strain your brain how to spread the Sankirtan movement. Strain your brain, which means, you know, just... Be creative. Always think. Don't don't think you've reached the end of the of the ways you can distribute. Always be creative. Even distributing in the same way, you can be creative, right? And do it. And and then um, one time, Prabhupada joked. I forget the context. Unfortunately, I can't remember the context. But he wanted us to do something like like I think it might have been in India. Big. He and it's all. All the devotees, all or the vast majority of devotees that went to India with Prabhupada in 19, I think, October of 1970, were Americans because the movement was basically predominantly America, the United States. And they were doing something, and Prabhupada wanted it on a huge scale. And then this was Prabhupada's joke. He said, what is the use of you being Americans if you can't do something big? Because, you know, America is like famous for like doing something big, right? The greatest country in the world, at least, you know, until China destroys us, right? Anyway, 
till China becomes the greatest country in the world or India. I think it's more going to be a battle between India and China than America, India and China. Because the, the moral fiber of America is crashing. Of course, the moral fiber of India is kind of crashing also. But so that was Prabhupada's joke. What, what's the use of you being Americans if you can't do something wonderful? But you know, you can apply that to your own self. You know, like you're 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 in the West, Western countries. At that time, India was a poverty struck and poverty stricken country. And you know, the whole the roads were bad, most you know, huge percentages of children were not educated. Uh, lots of disease that was not being controlled, you know. And so Prabhupada said, America, Western, you know, Western, look how together you are in the Western country. Prabhupada, one lecture, he said, yeah, America is very nice. Your roads are like silk. And, you know, do you ever think, do you ever think like that? You know, in your country, your roads are like silk. Well, if you come from a country that has potholes every three feet, you would. And that was India at that time. You couldn't. You couldn't drive across India. You destroy your car. There's so many potholes. I mean, yeah, it was just, it was really bad, really primitive. Even today, the road to Mayapur is after the rainy season. It's horrible. So um, now where you are in the Western countries, very modern, very comfortable. So what's the use of being Western? We can't do something great. Or we can. Say, what's the use of being you unless you do something great? So there, there's no stereotype way to distribute books, although you can learn how and be given mantras and say things that work. But at the same time, oh, I tell you a story. At the same time, you have your own creativity. I told this story once, beautiful story. You will like it. It will inspire you to be more creative. So... Some book distributors were thinking about training devotees. You know, this is what you say. This is when this is, you greet people with this saying. Then you say this. Then you give the book. Then you open to this page. Show this verse. Then say this. Say that. Ask them this question. Then you then you ask for donation this way. So they thought in doing that it would make it easier for devotees, and devotees would be more effective, which makes sense. And so they presented that idea to Prabhupada. And he was okay with it, but he wasn't excited about it. Would you like to know why he wasn't excited? He had mixed, he had mixed feelings about it. You ever have mixed feelings about an idea? Like it's, it's kind of like a good idea, but it's like, it's not all good. It's partially good. We we're thinking of doing a restaurant and we we're going to make this and that. And you're like, that's a good idea. And we're thinking of putting the restaurant in the, you know, poorest part of the poorest, the poorest section of the poorest town in our country that has the most crime and violence because we're going to, with prasadam, we're going to solve that problem. Like, I like the pizza and ice cream, but the poorest of the poorest section, I don't think they could actually afford pizza and ice cream because they can hardly afford bread and rice and potatoes, something like that. So, so um, Prabhupada said, um, he said it's okay, but it's a little artificial. And what he meant was that it takes away the creativity of the individual book distributor. And then Prabhupada quoted the saying, I don't know where it comes from, you've all heard it, every man is his, is his own genius. Every man is his own genius. Like we have, we have our own creativity. So if you, uh, you, let's take a, an example of music, right? So we're going to say, Sydney, I want you to sing this song by the Beatles. That she's going to, and I say, let's sing it your way. Sing it the way you feel it. So let's say it's a Paul McCartney song. So, so I want you to sing Blackbird. You live in the south of America where there used to be slaves and you know your neighborhood. And Blackbird's about freeing the slaves. You know, she goes, Yeah. Yeah, I heard about that. I don't like that. Okay, you can sing it. You you feel it more than he does. So she she'll sing it, you know, in a different way. Blackbird. You know, different, right? 
Blackbird singing in the dead of night. And it's not the way he sang it, right? But that's the way she feels it. So they're so in the world of music, some artist will sing a famous song, but they'll do it their way, right? Their own, the way they feel it. And they have creativity. And you have this thing called remix where you take a song <clears throat> and then you make it a, uh, uh, you bring it into a different genre of music as you, the genre that you like. And then you, you add drum beats and this and that. So that was Prabhupada's point that every man is his own genius. Like give him the freedom and creativity to distribute books that in a way that works for him. And I have a story of a God brother. It's a funny story. He was one of the best book distributors ever. And nobody could figure out how he distributed books. It was like mystic power. He would say things to, to people and they would take books. And he, these were the people that nobody else could distribute books to, all these stuffy businessmen, business suits. You know, we're like 22 years old. These guys are like 40 and 50, you know, the age of our fathers and like stuffy. And, and what interest do they have in yoga? in 1974, none. And he convinced them to take books. Like we were like, oh my God. And he could tell you every day before he went out, he would tell me how many books he's going to distribute. So I'll distribute this many books and then I'll come back. And that's exactly what he did. He'd come back. I go, so did you distribute 25 books? He said, yeah. <laughs> One day he distributed 108. He said, today I distributed 108. That was the day Prabhupada came. He said, he said, Prabhupada's coming to the airport. I'm not going back to the temple. I'm going to stay at the airport. If I see Prabhupada today, I can distribute 108. And he did. So he told me the story. He said, he got trained up on book distribution. Dis book, book distribution, or as they say in, in Germany and Switzerland, book distribution. Because that was, that was really where book distribution was like the strongest. It was Germany and Switzerland. Those were the like Maharathis of book distribution under the in the days of Hari Kesh Maharaj. Book distribution. But even saying book distribution, <clears throat> you have to be have no mucus in your throat to say that. So so he was trained up how to do, you know, they say, you know, say, you say, Hey, where are you coming in from? You know, and they'll say, I'm coming in from Seattle. And you go, oh, I've got an uncle in Seattle. You don't have an uncle in Seattle. You just say that, you know, because it makes them feel like you're kindred spirits, right? Really? What do you do? Oh, my God. I studied that in college. You didn't study that in college. You know, it's like pretty artificial, you know? And then you give them a book and you say a few things, mostly not about the book. And um, and you just ask for a donation and they, you know, they want to give you a dollar or two. And you say, they say, how much? And you just go, well, give whatever you can. And then this is how we were trained and you'll understand why he didn't like it. You can already understand why he didn't like it. And, and the training was don't say much about the book because the more you say about the book, the more they have a reason not to want to buy it. It was, you know, and so how do you get the donation? You just tell them, give whatever you can. And then when they go to give you a dollar or two, you say, you know, I have a lot of single bills. Do you have a larger bill, like a 10 or 20? I'll give you change. And they'll say, okay. So then they give you a 10 or 20. And then you say, you know, a lot of people are actually giving 20. You think you could do that. So out of, all of a sudden you've upped the ante, right? So, so they might say, oh, just take five or okay, take 10, or okay, keep the 20. And depending how insistent you are, to that degree of your insistence, to that degree, they'll be disgusted with you, basically. And some devotees are very insistent. Uh, you know, they'll say, no, 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 this is how it goes. They'll say, I'll give you five. Then you'll give them 10 back and say, can we leave it at that? 10. And sometimes they'll go, all right. And sometimes, okay, Jason, this is really, get something you want to punch. You might punch a wall after you hear this. Yeah, pushing way too much. But here's the worst one. So they give 20. Well, this is the worst, worst. Could you give 20? A lot of people do that. And before they can say anything, you say, thank you, and you walk away. 
Hare Krishna. Yeah, so it, it was horrible. So this devotee, you know, he was trained like that. And he told me, he said, when I saw the way they trained, I told myself, I never, ever will distribute books like that. And he developed his own style. Completely unique style. Nobody could imitate it. Only he could do it. We couldn't figure out why anybody would take a book from him. But he had like mystic power. It fit his personality, his nature and his style. He was very like, he was very um, focused and, you know, you give people a book, these businessmen, was, these, you know, see these verses, Sanskrit this is all scientifically, you know, this is all actually science. This is actually proven and et cetera. Et cetera. They take books like somehow. So um, now Prabhupada said something really interesting, which I think is applicable not only to book distribution, but to everything. He said, if people feel that you are their friend, when friends means you have their interest in mind, you're not cheating them. He said, if they feel that you're their friend, they'll take a book. Isn't it true if you go to a store to buy something, you have a salesman and you like them, you're more inclined to buy? There was a devotee, he was a number one salesman, this electronic shop. And I said, do you know anything about electronics? He said, no, I don't know anything. I said, how do you do it? And he said, I just get them to like me and then they buy because they like me, they trust me. You want to... You don't want to buy from somebody you don't like, right? You want to buy from someone you like, isn't it? Then you trust them. So that was Prabhupada's, you know, but it his was his point. It's a sales point, but it's a, it's a philosophy. The devotee is everyone's friend. So you should be their friend. You should, they should feel you as their friend. And then he, Prabhupada didn't say this, but the conclusion is they will trust you and they'll want to take a book. So then what I did, this is one of insider secret, power users, insider secret for book distribution. Then what I started doing was I, I would, everyone I approach, I would pretend like this is my best friend. Like I would imagine my best friend and I think this is him. And I would deal with that person exactly like that was my friend. In fact, on Sankirtan, because I grew up in Los Angeles and I was in the temple for many years, I, saw, I, I remember meeting one of my friends from high school, like one of my closest friends. But, um, and I'll be thinking today when I go on Sankirtan, I'll probably meet my other closest friends. I never did. But whenever I dealt with people as if this was actually my friend or a family member, it was very interesting because I could see that the, they felt differently. There was more trust and they were more comfortable with me. So that's an insider's power secret to book distribution. Deal with people like, like this is a family member, or an old friend, you know, although they don't look like your old friend or family member, but pretend they are and just deal with them as you would and see what happens. Okay, so it looks like there's some conversation. There's some chit chat in the chat. Well, not chit chat, kata, prashna, questions. Okay, let's see what we got here. For Christina, I am great distributing books if I don't have to ask for a donation. Usually I buy them myself, yeah. Well, I wanna tell you a story, Christina. This might help you. You don't have to do this, but I'm just gonna explain the story. Some of you may have heard this story. It's a great Sankirtan story. This, the airport couldn't get rid of us, so they thought if they harass us, that we won't come back. So they told the, the, the people, you know, like the people, the checkout, whatever you call them, the people who work behind the counter, I don't want to call them flight attendants. Anyway, the people that work behind the counters in airports when you, when you go to get your ticket, it, um, they're not always busy because there's hours where there's no flights. And those days you have, nowadays those people go to the gate and they check in. In those days, they just stayed at the front. So they had time. And when they had time, they were told, tell people they don't have to buy these books. We somehow try to get people not to take the books. So this one lady was following, following me. And when I'd give someone a book, she was pretty polite. You know, it's not like they wanted to do this. So when I give someone a book and tell them, 
and they're about to give a donation, she would say, you don't have to give a donation if you don't want to. But it was very low key. It's like it didn't. You know, some people would say, oh, okay, and give the book back. And then I thought, all right, now what to do? Not everybody did, but now what to do? So Christina, this is what I did. This only thing I thought would work. Before she would say it, I would say it. Let's say her name was Susan. So I'd give them a book and say, we ask for donations, but you don't have to give a donation if you don't want to. And I said, isn't that right, Susan? And so she was happy that I was saying it because that's what she was supposed to say. And she didn't realize it was backfiring because when I would say, you don't have to give a donation if you don't want to, isn't that right, Susan? It looked like I work for the airport because there's a, a person in a, you know, an airport uniform with me. So it looked like we were a team. And so what I found is with lots and lots of people, when you say you don't have to, they say, no, no, I'll give something. It like switches it. It feels like, no, I don't want to be a jerk and not give a donation. So um, that's something you might, you, if you feel comfortable, you could say that and say, um, we distribute these books freely. This book is yours. If you'd like to give a donation to help our work, that would be fantastic. If you don't want to, that's also fine. And now they kind of feel like, okay, I'm going to be a jerk and not give a donation because they just told me I don't have to. <laughs> so sometimes it works that way. So Christina, if you feel inclined, you could try that and see what happens. You don't have to give a donation. It's fine. You don't, if you don't want to, you don't have to. This book is yours. As Vaisheshika Kapoor would say, but if you do, it's part of the ancient culture. Then when you give for a gift you got, then the knowledge becomes, I forget how he says it, but maybe somebody knows that the knowledge, you you gain the knowledge that's in the book when you give something for it. He said, but otherwise, we, you know, these books are paid for. We don't need the money. Don't worry. Something like that. I had a teacher. Um, he was selling, he was selling a course. The course was $2,900. It was a five-day course, $2,900. And you know, one of the things he said, he said, um, I'm a multimillionaire. I don't need the money. This is for you. So it kind of downplayed the price. He needed the money to buy a second yacht, I'm sure. But technically speaking, he didn't need the money, but he's a businessman. So businesses always need money. But by saying that, it feels like, oh, this is for me. The book's for you. It's for your benefit. We don't need the money. And you don't have to, unless you want to, because you know you can, when we can sell, we can distribute more books. If we get donations, more books for other people, if you like, something like that, simple. So that way, any normal person would just be totally okay with that because you already said it's okay not to. So that was my discovery. It actually worked better. You don't have to give a donation if you don't want to, we just ask for it. I mean, you can be a jerk and not give a donation. No, I didn't say that. Although with some people, I was so funny, I could say it. What about distributing a movie, the Hare Krishna movie? Yeah, yeah, of course. Distribute anything you want with the book, including your phone number or email ID. Stay in touch. How to prolong the time you are outside distributing books. I found after some time I run out of energy by distributing more books. The more you distribute, the more energy you get. Or go to a different place where people might be better. If you're distributing at a place that's really hard, you're running out of energy very quickly. But, or learn how to distribute more books or do a table and sit down. Of course, in your country, you'll freeze, right? Unless you can do it inside. Anyway, tables, you just have a table and call people over. Yoga meditation. From Shalini, she says, Cookies work well with book distribution. Yes. Some people may at least take us. Yeah. Definitely. Bring out cookies. Yeah. First, have them eat the cookie, then ask for the donation. Your donations will increase that way. Right? Uh, I have a question. I distributed my first books last Saturday. Even though I only distributed two books, I was still happily surprised to see how open people seem to be. 
felt welcome out there and had a few nice conversations. What I'm struggling with is how to let people pay for them or rather how much when they ask how much I answer that we distribute them for donations. It seems to confuse people and they rather skip the book instead of taking the risk to give too little to them. Yeah, that's true. I've understood that we're not meant to have a fixed, but no, you can, you can suggest. I would happily give them away, but I also believe chances are bigger that people will read them generally if they pay, if they've invested at least something, yeah. So this is, um, this is also for Christina. Um, you know, one of the things about money is that we, we, you know, a lot of devotees had this, you know, it's kind of like there's knowledge and there's money and it seemed to be like two like different universes, you know, and for me it was, very easy to distribute books if I didn't have to think about money. And very easy to think about money if I didn't have to distribute books. It's just like go out, get donations. Can you give a donation? I'm a hungry monk. I go, okay, here, hungry monk, here's a donation. I could do that. But then the donations for the books, it was like, eh. so what I realized that it was just my own concept. So what we would have to remind ourselves was that when they give a donation, it's good for them. As you mentioned, if they give a donation, they're more likely to read it, that Prabhupada said that. Maybe not in every case. Some people are just interested and don't have money. But a lot of it is our own fear. And the problem is when you are shy about giving a donation or you have, you have um, reservations about asking for a donation, it's communicated to other people and they start feeling that way. Whereas if you don't have those reservations, they don't have them either. So I'll tell you a story. This is an interesting story. So there's a man who is a consultant, a business consultant. And his fee is $15,000 an hour or a half hour of consultant. And he's like, that good. You pay me $15,000 for my one hour consultation. That This month you'll make $150,000 more than you normally would. Okay, it's worth $15,000, right? Um, there are very few consultants that charge that much. 300, 500, 600 an hour. It's kind of high end, 1,000 an hour. 2,000, 3,000 really high end consultants. So they asked them, how can you charge 15,000 an hour for your services? He said, you just have to say it with a straight face. That was his answer, which was true and funny at the same time. How much do you charge? My, uh, sir, my fees are 15,000 an hour. When would you like to make an appointment? It was a straight face. But if you say, well, my fees are, <sighs> not everyone can afford that, it's a little high. They're actually 15,000, you know. But um, for me, I, I have a tendency to want to joke with people. So they say, how much? And I go, wow, for a rich guy like you, sky's the limit, right? Um, so if you, you know, cause it's a friend, you're drilling with them like a friend, that may be uncomfortable for you. Then just give them a price and say, well, you know, around more or less around $3, more or less around five, more or less around 10, like that. Or some devotees will say, well, it cost us $2 to print this book. So if you could give at least that much, that would be nice. If you, if you are okay with asking for it, they'll be okay with giving it. If you're not okay, it's gonna affect them or you will attract people that aren't okay with giving money. And so it's like, so you have to work on that internally also. You have to be comfortable with it. So, um, so that's one way of doing it. Say, so this is what it costs to print. So if you can give that or a little more, if you give a little more, it goes to, we can distribute more books. And to say, is that okay with you? Are you all right with that? And they'll go, sure. Because whatever it costs to print is way less than what you would think you would pay in a bookstore. You say, I know this book likes, if you went to a bookstore, it would be $20, um, but it actually cost us $4 to print. So 
that's what I would do. I always like to give the retail price. You say, yeah, in a bookstore, it's, it's like 20 bucks, but um, cost us $4 to print. So if you could give like at least that, you know, four or five, 10, you know, that would be great. Something like that. But, you know, it's totally up to you. Don't be an anxiety. I don't want to put you in anxiety. So once you establish the relationship with them, right? When you have a relationship with someone as friend, they trust you, you can say anything. Right. So that's that's the main thing is build trust and friendship, you know, within the first like 10 seconds. You know, like, you know, a mother and daughter are together and you tell the joke, oh, sisters. Right. And you're like, yeah, right. They know you're just flattering them. Um, but they like it. Because you're funny. Right. And if people like you, then they won't. If people like you, then whatever you say, they're not going to take offense. Krishna will inspire you how to do it. Um, pushing too much for a donation? Yeah. That story I told, yeah. Was it Neil Pert from Rush in the airport? Took a book. Um, I can't remember. I think it was the drummer for a band called Traffic. Maybe not. Bigger band. I don't know. I probably met so many. I used to live in the airport for like five years, you know, every day, distributing books. Who knows who I met? Sometimes you don't know until someone says, you know who you were just talking to? No, says, that guy's a famous this and that. We're brahmacharis. We don't know who's famous. We don't have social media. We don't even know who the president of the United States is. We don't know anything. We don't read newspapers. How would we know? We don't watch movies. That's one of the most famous. This and we're like, yeah, whatever. You know, he's as famous as Lord Brahma. Yeah, I don't think so. So we, you know, so who knows who we met? You know, I do Krishna. But I found out there was a, one of the biggest bands of the 70s was a group called Heart. I don't think they're around anymore. Um, you can look it up if you want. And one of my high school friends is the guitarist, and I didn't know that. And I had met him before he became famous. I had I'd seen him distributing books in 1970. He was in Vancouver. I was like, hey, what are you doing up here? You know, so I'm playing some gig. I think that band became famous in like 77 or something. So you never know. They're still around, Heart, yeah. When I was in high school, he had a band. And it was so good, they got signed to a record label when they were 17 years old. So, maybe I should call him up and bring him prasadam or something. Um, yeah, so, you know, it's, a, it's actually a fact that if you're in the right mood, then when you ask for a donation, it's not a problem, and you establish a nice relationship with people, they like you, then it's easy. I especially do that with Mexicans. I think you give a donation, I say, and you're a rich man. And they go, oh, I'm not rich. And I go, yeah, you are. Look at your belly. It's so big. You must be rich. You know, you could joke with them like, you eat a lot. Only rich people can get that fat. You know, you can, you know, if you have the relationship with them, you can do that. And they'll just laugh and they'll, go, <laughs> they'll give you a donation. Oh, I really like that guy. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, time and place. Okay. So we're going to end class here. This serves to be the, the class to inaugurate the Christmas marathon and inspire you to do something, whatever it is. Um, and you will... Uh, you will experience the bliss of book distribution. Um, take books with you wherever you go. You never know who you meet. And uh, <laughs> some devotee would do something like, he'd be sitting on a bus and he'd bend down. <laughs> and he'd have a book in his hand. He'd bend down and he'd turn to the person. I just found this. Is this your book? Did you lose this? <laughs> and he'll go. Oh, that book looks kind of interesting. Karma. You know anything about karma? So let me see that book. Yeah. Oh, you want to take it? Yeah, I'll read it. So it's like, you know, whatever you have to do. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Okay, let's end class here. Class is over. Okay.